Ladies and gentlemen, this is Art Linkletter. What you are about to hear is the testimonial dinner given by the Friars Club at the Beverly Hilton Hotel for Desi Arnaz and Lucille Ball, which unhappily ended on a tragic note with the passing of one of the most popular friars of them all, Harry Einstein, better known as Parkyakarkas. This album is a permanent record of his last and possibly finest performance. Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it is my enviable privilege to welcome you to the celebration of this, the 10th anniversary of the founding of the Friars Club of California. And this occasion could not be more fittingly observed than to do honor, as is our custom, to outstanding personalities who symbolize in themselves and in their art the finest traditions of the entertainment profession. And friends, these annual dinners have a humanitarian facet. For with the proceeds of your generosity, you make it possible for the friars to continue its rewarding labors in alleviating the cares of the needy and the distress of the sick. The amount of money realized through the years for these lofty purposes has now exceeded a million and a half dollars. A magnificent tribute to you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, what we so happily honor tonight is really a dual personality, each so delightfully complimenting the other that both have acquired one name, Desi Lu, already imperishably emblazoned on the theatrical horizon. And now, friends, to get things underway, will you all join in Here's to the Friars, all together. Everybody. Here's to the Friars. Here's to them all. Out on the road or here in the hall. Raise by your glasses with a tear. To the boys we love most, our toast to all. Ladies and gentlemen, who more worthily? can preside as our Toastmaster for the evening, then that possessor of so many wonderful qualities, accomplished actor, wit, intellectual, and more important than anything else, a most wonderful guy, Art Linkletter. What a rowdy bunch of hams up here. Uh, but what a beautiful audience out here. I've never seen a group like this before. Ed Sullivan's going to be very happy with this, Kinney. <laughs> whole thing's an audition, you know, for CBS. <laughs> I'm here because the other afternoon, busy counting my refrigerators and washing machines, a phone rang, and George Jessel said that he's being called out of town on a humanitarian mission, and would I replace him? Turns out now he's auditioning for the Yiddish theater lead in the Hebrew version of Lolita in New York. <laughs> But he conned me into it. Here I am. And um, if I don't do well tonight, you can blame Georgie. Replacing Jessel. It's a pretty tough thing. He took all his girls with him. But anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I uh, have been here on the dais many, many times in this room and in other rooms for the Friars. And I've never seen a more distinguished and interesting group of people from all over the country. They've come here tonight. And I know that you're going to have a wonderful evening. I should be nervous, I suppose, but uh, all I have to remember is that my audience is all home in bed now, so no matter what happens to you, I'm safe. <coughs> They're the home set. And, of course, nothing can ever make me nervous again after interviewing children under six years of age on a live television camera, as you, some of you know. No matter what happens, it's happened. Just last week, 
uh, a little presentiment of something to come in the way of uh, a Spaniard, a little Spanish girl, half Spanish, half English, was on the program. Made me think of uh, Des, as you know, been on the air for years. None of us have ever really known uh, what he said. But at all, all events, this little girl, <laughs> little girl was on my house party this week, and she was talking in kind of a broken English. And I said to her finally, what do you, this is the truth to help me. I said, what do you want to be when you grow up? She says, I want to be a wee-wee girl. And uh, she thought for me, she says, no, no, a can-can girl. <laughs> Uh, phone rang, there was Hubble Robinson. <laughs> Those kind of things have endeared me to anything that may happen on a dais, because the children speak the truth, and we may hear it occasionally this evening as we go through the program. I want to point out that the floral decorations and all of the beautiful statuary around the wall are uh, left over from last night's program for Queen Frederica of Greece. Now, uh, this is not... Um, this is not said uh, chidingly to the friars. This is, it's beautiful. The decorations are beautiful. I like that one over there, especially posed by Jane and Mickey. Uh, inside. But these things save money. By using the decorations, the friars save a lot of money, which goes to charity. Actually, an MC on a dais like this has a <coughs> lead pipe cinch. All I really have to do is say, and now, and then get out of the way because there's several million dollars worth of talent stacked up here and there up and down the dais. That's true, that's true. True. <laughs> where else in America, it's really a, a portrait in democracy, because where else but in America would such a distinguished group get together to pay tribute to two people <clears throat> just because they're so rich? <laughs> now, actually, money is one of the motivating influences why I'm here. <clears throat> By doing Friars things, I get to mingle with people like Harry Carl, Archie Priceman, and others. And over the year, I get tips on stock market, oil well drilling, real estate. Last year, as a result of their tips, I was able to write off over $300,000. <laughs> uh, as a matter of fact, one of the other reasons besides charity tonight is that we are announcing tonight that you are the first group to be on the inside and a chance to get the 525,000 shares of Desi Lu, which will shortly be on the market. Now, don't laugh. When I first met Desi, he owed the Gould Investment Company $37 on a pair of bongo drums. <laughs> and then came Lucy, and I love Lucy, and then came Desi Lu. You know the financial story of this empire. Two years ago, $3 and a half a share profit. Then they bought RKO last year, 10 cents a share profit. And so naturally, they want to share this good fortune with the public. <laughs> I'd, say, I'd say it was a golden opportunity, except for one thing. Why are their bags packed and the motor running? <laughs> However, the fact is that they have made a fabulous empire out of some jokes and some heartwarming entertainment that the American public has voted number one for so many years. Now, tonight we have a number of fine speakers, and they have all of their points made. There are only a few at the dais, but they represent over 350 writers who are now in oxygen tents <laughs> around town. It's just a little casual get-together. But uh, we, are, um, we are going to just uh, kind of uh, ad-lib our way through the show, in a sense. Actually, the very first item on the program is an unexpected one. I was just given a note a few moments ago that there is one guest who is not on the dais who is going to have a chance to say a few words. And I'd like to introduce him now. He was not here for the dinner. He came just for this occasion. From the British Consulate, Sir Francis Bailey Watson, who has just arrived, and I think he's backstage. Sir Bailey Watson. Ladies and gentlemen, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth has granted me the great privilege of giving welcome to our honored guests, who, through their kindliness and their love, have endeared themselves to the whole world. Now, their visit here tonight 
will still further cement the strong ties already existing between us. Now, this is a night long to be remembered. Ladies and gentlemen, let us bid welcome to Her Most Gracious Majesty, Frederica, Queen of Greece. One night too late. <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. Very sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but this sort of thing happened to me with the AAs one night out here. <laughs> However, we'll go on because we do have a number of very distinguished guests, some of whom could not be here from foreign governments and who sent wires. We have a wire here, come home anytime, Desi, signed Fidel Castro. <laughs> Have a wire here from Liberace. Sorry, this is my night to help George stuff the pizzas. <laughs> Jack Benny sent a wonderful wire. He says, sorry, I cannot be with you tonight. I'm in New York catching cold. <laughs> Hello, that's Jack Benny. Bing Crosby is not here. He's a family man, as you know, on Sundays. He's home reading the papers, seeing how his boys are, <laughs> and where, <laughs> and what for, and for how long. <laughs> It's a very difficult thing, you know, to know who is first and who is last. And the person who is last is usually the one who wants to kill the person who made the selection of who is to be introduced. But first tonight certainly must be the dean of our Hollywood performers here, a man who first came to Hollywood years ago as a dancer. Came here, as a matter of fact, he was a child star under the name of Jackie Cooper. George Murphy wanted to be Benita Granville, but the name was taken, and he <laughs> did the best he could with Jack. He became the goodwill ambassador for Hollywood, as you know it, MGM. In fact, he developed such an ingratiating personality, he could tell people to go to hell and they were anxious to get started. <laughs> well, that's the kind of a guy George is. Now, Vice President of Desi Lu, working with them out there, and one of the last living Republicans in California. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, George Murphy. Thank you very much, Art. Ladies and gentlemen, I am here tonight representing Pat Brown. <laughs> I would consider it a great honor. Actually, there have been many questions tonight as to why I am on the dais, and I'll explain it very briefly. First of all, with a cast such as this, it's quite a, quite a problem to decide who goes first. So they said, we'll put some names in a hat. And they reached in, and they all were Murphy. <laughs> there are reasons for this. First of all, I serve the purpose of the bicarbonate of soda to give you a chance to let your dinner digest before the hilarious festivities which will take place here. And second, I have never been known to tell any jokes that anybody else might use. <laughs> Therefore, all this talent will be safe. <laughs> And there's a third reason. There's a third reason. You will notice here that practically all the prime time is represented here at this table. And I thought it was only fair that the people who wander through your homes on the late, late show should be here. I am one of those. It's a little embarrassing when my daughter gets up in the morning and said, who is that young man I saw in that picture last night using your name? I am glad to be here tonight because it is always a pleasure to be in a room filled with ladies and gentlemen such as here gathered for the purpose that has brought you all here tonight, to honor two wonderful people. It has been my privilege to be associated with show business, show folks for 35 years. I have known many, many people in my travels. I know of no two that not only have great talent, but are sincere, nice, kind, sentimental people that exemplify all the things that we like to think is the best in show business. 
Lucy, Desi, God bless you, and thank you for letting me be aboard, and congratulations to the Friars Club for the good judgment in selecting you two to be honored this year. Thank you. see Tony Martin here tonight for a while and reading over the lists that were submitted to me of people who'd be here. I thought that the committee was emphasizing talent too much and was overlooking sex. <laughs> Tony adds this vital ingredient to an otherwise almost all masculine group up here with his off-the-shoulder tuxedo and his Florida tan and pearl, pearl gray spats. Looks like a luscious lamb chop over there. <laughs> While not Dean Martin's father, Tony has done some wonderful things. <laughs> Recently signed a million-dollar contract. To which, uh, which one of the spas up there, Tony? Desert, Desert Inn. East Key. Desert Inn. Desert Inn. <laughs> and so I know that you'll be mighty happy to hear Tony. I'm going to say, well, the nicest thing that anyone can say about Tony is Sid Charisse. <laughs> You're on, Tony. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very honored to be on the stage here with all these distinguished performers. And I just want to say to Desi and Lucille, I won't take up too much of your time, but knowing the history of your success, I, I have uh, confined my remarks to something put to music. A recording of mine, which I made in 1951 in our RCA Victor record number 685739. Uh, recently been released again on long playing record number 68532. Desi and I go to the steam rooms. We look each other over. He's quite a boy. And uh, we discuss some of the things that he's thinking about and things he wants to do. So, uh... Alberto, give me an arpeggio. Each time I'm driving in my car and I pass Metro, I get ideas. I get ideas. My little bank account would be a bit more juicy if I could change that name to Metro Desilusi. <laughs> Each time I see that great big lot in Culver City, I get ideas, I get ideas. A little property like that would come in handy as just an annex to my RKO. I went out to the valley and looked at Universal. I'd use it for rehearsal, but it belongs to MCA. I think I've got an idea that's good. I'll buy up all Hollywood and change the name to Desi Lewis. Of course, Sid goes to the beauty parlor, and she sits next to Lucy. And Lucy was telling Sid about some of the things that Desi plans in the future. Oh, I get dizzy when my Desi starts to dreaming. He gets ideas. He gets ideas. He says if he could buy the coast, it would be terrific. And for a parking lot, he'd dry up the Pacific. <laughs> He had a bid in for Alaska, but he blew it. The U.S. Senate just beat him to it. Right now he has his little eye on old Hawaii, providing now that the price is right. He keeps on making money with things that he acquires. He'd love to buy the friars and jack up all the dues with many bright ideas like this. Oh, how can he miss? Someday he'll be the Cuban Howard Hughes. I It 
seems rather superfluous to introduce Milton Burrow. He's been on for the last hour. <laughs> However, he is the abbot emeritus of the friars, having been the abbot of the New York friars for 14 years. And uh, it's history now, but you know he was signed by NBC to a 30-year contract. He gets paid whether he works or not, and that's why he's sitting there smiling. He gets a paycheck each week for doing nothing. He's on the air, you know, folks. I told you that wouldn't go. Milton is the top banana in the All-American Hall of Humor. There's no doubt of that. And he could take the rest of the evening up with just the material he cut out of his TV Academy appearance last year. But whatever he does, he's my nomination as one of the best men we'll ever have on any day as for anybody. Milton? Yeah. All yours. Yes. Thank you very much, Art Mooney, and I'm very happy. <laughs> One spotlight, please. I got an old suit on. I'm very happy. I thought you'd never call on me. I'm very happy to be here tonight and uh, to welcome uh, all these very wonderful people at this very great occasion to honor the Cuban Leopold and Loeb. <laughs> and, uh, he's explaining it to this. <laughs> Will you take the light off me, please? My eyes are very bad. I only keep looking for one thing. I want to... Can you see me better now? No, I, I'd rather have it on, Ru off, Ruth. Thank you. Uh, I want to tell you you're wonderful. People are funny, but in your case, forget it. I, uh... It's a hell of a crowd here tonight. Looks like an Arthur Murray lynching. I'm, uh, I've seen better crowd at... I lost up the joke. Everybody dance. Now... Actually, we have some of the greatest. I don't. I don't. We have some of the greatest, greatest array of comedians here tonight, and you'll hear some of the funniest things that they've ever done by me. And uh, actually, uh, uh, Art uh, was wrong. He uh, made a mistake about Jessel. You're doing a hell of a job here tonight. Really, very bad. And. Uh, <laughs> Actually, Art was wrong. Jessel uh, couldn't make it here tonight for another reason. He's on a very important mission. He went to Israel to try to get Sammy Davis into Hillcrest. And, uh, what can I say? May I say, ladies and gentlemen, that you haven't got a worry in the world, Art. You're very funny tonight, and don't make a habit of it. And I want to tell you... He's writing down my material. There's a switch stealing from me. This I never heard of. What the hell are you going to do in a situation comedy? I uh, want to tell you something. You, have no, you don't need to worry. We don't need Jessel here tonight, actually, because I predict that Mr. Linkletter is going to be one of our great Toastmasters one of these days. That's my prediction, but don't go by me, because 20 years ago I predicted Tallulah Bankhead would be a nun. <laughs> I prepared a lot of very wonderful material that I stole, that I uh, written. Some very funny jokes. <laughs> That's out. That's out. Who the hell told me this was going to be a stag? <laughs> Anybody want to buy 300 orgy jokes? Yeah. Yeah. But ladies and gentlemen, it is really a great deal of pleasure, really all kidding aside, to be here. And I want you to know that uh, uh, being here tonight for these very, very wonderful people makes me very, very happy. And as I look on the dais, which isn't very easy, and I see George Burns here when he should be home pleading with Gracie. And, um... And Dean Martin sitting over there drinking ashes. The, uh... Actually, Sammy Davis will be here, but he's over at Desperate Hours saying Kaddish, and I want you to know... Uh, incidentally, Bing Crosby got it wrong. He was going to be here tonight, and he will be here a little later. But don't bother to wait, because Kathy is driving. Now, this... Uh...
<laughs> Incidentally, Barry Merkin, who I'm sitting next to, who's doing a hell of a job tonight, got a wire. I don't think you read it. It was from Gleason, Jackie Gleason. He was supposed to be here tonight, but he couldn't make it. He's in New York. He's trying to lose 200 pounds. Buddy Hackett. And, uh... <laughs> Oscar, Oscar Levant was going to be here tonight, but he won't make it either. He's feeling good. <laughs> He's over at Big Tan. He's trying to strengthen the show. But this, uh... There's a guy. Did you see his program? He gets laughs with spasms. <laughs> We're here to talk about happiness, ladies and gentlemen. We're here to talk about these two very, very wonderful people. Latin, America's answer to frickin' frack. <laughs> But I want to tell you something, Desi. May I tell you? Just one word. Lucky. Now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, where? Philip Morris? Very good. I know. I remember the act. Used to yeah. get your bongo and get the hell out. Now. <laughs> where, ladies and gentlemen, where? But in a free America. In a young Jewish boy. Like Dave Arnstein here. <laughs> this Cuban bit is a laugh. It's not true. He's Jewish. His father was a rebel rabbi. <laughs> His aunt is Abby Lane out of Bill Frawley by Cougar. Let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You're lucky. You're lucky. You're lucky. Uh, you're lucky to have him. What the hell is Lucille Ball? Me in drag. <laughs> May I ask you, Miss Ball, what is your claim to fame? Orange hair? <laughs> Remember the act? Orange hair and seed? Listen to me. You ready? Listen, will you listen to me? I've, I've, I've been advising you for years when you're on my show. Ready? Stand by, will no, you? I won't stand by. <laughs> you listen to me, Desi? You don't need her. Loser. Dump her. She's nothing. Now may I introduce Jerry Giesler. <laughs> you could have made it without her, Desi. Could have made it without her. You could have made it with Arthur Blake. <laughs> and I think you did. But this, uh... say one more thing at this Friars dinner tonight, ladies and gentlemen. I will go on publicly and say this in front of everyone tonight. Their marriage will not last. It will end. You can laugh. Please. <laughs> Lucille, you're married. And when the marriage ends, what a settlement. Are you ready for the bit? She gets Redlands and he gets Alvira Street. <laughs> He gets RKO, he joins Castro. <laughs> Great story told about these people. May I go on record saying this? This no talent lady is sitting right here, knocking around Hollywood, drunk. On <laughs> Henry's. <laughs> she met this poor Nebuch here. This Fakakta wetback. Great story about these people. He went on and he took Dixon lessons from Akeem Tamarov. <laughs> and failed. <laughs> we may laugh at him, but one of these days he may buy the whole country. And we'll be the ones talking funny. <laughs> when he came to this country, ladies and gentlemen, when he came to Hollywood ten years ago, what did he come here with? 300 gallons of hair oil. <laughs> and how did she fit into the picture? She sold it to him. <laughs> now he rules the world. Desi, may I tell you, he's an important man. I kid him. He is a very important... He's so important. May I tell you how important he is? He is the only man in Hollywood 
that knows Leo Carrillo's home phone number. <laughs> and all through this, they have built an empire. Fabulous studios, spare no expense. Who do you think he has as the attendant in the men's room at Desilu? Edith Head. <laughs> Brilliant man, brilliant! Knows all about great production. One day, he was called on the set. They were in trouble. He walked on the set, solved the whole problem. He said, Baba Lou, and they did it! <laughs> May I say, ladies and gentlemen, with all my clowning, with all, with all their money, they still have friends. <laughs> with money, picture studios, crooked ratings... <laughs> Friendship is a very, very important thing, and that's why we're all here tonight. And in conclusion, may I quote the words of Dr. Billy Graham, the great evangelist, who said only last week, I say this to you, Desi, Dr. Billy Graham said, show me a man that has lots of friends, and I'll show you a fag. Good night. <laughs> was the clean stuff. <laughs> I wonder what he threw away. <laughs> the whole nation was entertained by Dean Martin and his big hours show on TV, which some of you saw. It was a great show on for Timex, bourbon, gin, vodka, <laughs> Cushman golf scooters, my sin perfume. I listed them all off estimated he makes more on the side than he does from the show but Dean it was a great show actually the team of Martin and Linkletter will never be known as a show business team but actually we do work together I interview the kids and he supplies them <laughs> of course we don't get to see each other much I do my work in the studio <laughs> but Dean you always have a song and a parody and a lilting melody for our guests of honor at dozen of these prior things, so come on up and let's hear if you're in good voice tonight. Boy, I wouldn't give this spot to a leopard. Where did you get? Oh, good. What did you pick on me for? I didn't... Man, there ain't nothing left, I tell you that. Well... No, it's just a pleasure and an honor to be here for my two wonderful friends, Desi and Arnez. And I just want to say... <laughs> now, just two days ago, I want you people to know that only two days ago, I signed a contract with uh, Desi Lou Productions to do a new TV series on uh, television next year. It's a Western series. It's called Frontier Drunk. It's going to be a wonderful thing. <laughs> It's on at 3.30 for the kiddies. <laughs> Sponsored by Seagram's. So, uh, you know how funny that would have been if he wasn't on first? Well, <laughs> well, listen, as the fly said as he was walking over the mirror, that's one way of looking at it. Here's a song that, uh, I wonder who won the first race. We're going to, uh, Mr. Ken Lane. Here's a little parody. I hope you... Excuse me. Enjoy it. Just had a bowl of bourbon and some crackers and ain't laying right. Tell you we, uh... Ten minutes from now, it would have been a riot. I'll tell you that. Oh, here it is. <laughs> Oh, Daisy, oh, 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 Lucy, oh, let's sing 
of how it began. The redhead and the Cuban. He was beating a bongo and she was a bee girl. I mean that her films were just fair. And let's face it, a fella who beats on a bongo's a square. What I mean is you wouldn't have given these two schmoes a prayer. Oh, Desi. Oh. Oh, Lucy. Oh. Nell Blue. Dip into the blue. And I was with you know who. Is there a person who cannot remember the date? That memorable date way back in the year 48. They'd finished the script for a pilot that no one would buy. And only cause Desi insisted that he play the guy. <laughs> oh, murder. Oh, no, Desi. No, 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 no. The sponsor said, not a chance. We'll go for Frawley and Vance. But the boy with the accent, a fella from Cuba, he speaks into native a tongue. If we cast him from every antenna, we're sure to be hung. What they really expected is someone like, say, Alan Young. <laughs> oh, Desi. Oh. They fought and screamed like all hell, and I was still with J.L. And meanwhile, the trouble that Desi gave Hubble was making poor Robinson bleed until Ackerman wickened and said, let's give Desi the lead. Even Paley consented, but said, find out first, can he read? <laughs> Oh, 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 and Lucy, go, 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 and so the pilot was shot, now let's go on with the plot, thanks to the writing of Oppenheimer, Carol, and Pugh. The wet back is now the colossus we call Desilu. <laughs> I know that you'll think that I'm pressing to say something funny. But nowadays, fellas like Howard Hughes call him for money. <laughs> oh, Desi. Oh, They got the dough. <laughs> They're both right up on the top. And I'm a single old wop. May I drink to the glories and drink to the triumphs, to each of the goals you've attained. May I drink to the power and to the position you've gained. May I drink. May I drink? May I drink? Till the last drop is drained. May I drink? <laughs> it's the only reason I did this number, you know. <laughs> oh, I'm with you. Thank you.
George Burns and Desi have a couple of things in common. They each have empires in TV production. George is the head of McCadden production, and uh, Desi, uh, president of Desi Lou. And they both owe a little to a couple of gorgeous gals who had a little talent. Actually, George Burns is having his first season as a single, as many of you know, and he had a wonderful reaction so far. All of his friends are staying right with him and <laughs> standing by him. But George is really a comedian's comedian. Whenever you see a bunch of comics standing around, they're always listening to George. So no matter where you introduce him in a program, he's sort of a piece de resistance, which, as you know, is French for a girl who says no. <laughs> but George... <clears throat> has a very high rating in this town. He's third back of refineries as a smog menace. His... <laughs> His performance lets off more hydrocarbons than Benny's Maxwell, and so it's my pleasure right now to bring you Gracie Allen's favorite smudge pot, George Burns. George. Thank you very much. It's sort of, um, this is going to, mixed audience usually cramps my style. <laughs> And it's bad enough to try to get a few Snickers with one guest of honor, but with two, it's just murder. And um, with both Desi and Lucy up there, I can't even get risque because I'm sure that Desi would resent it. <laughs> I, I can't even tell any sexy jokes with Desi and Lou up here because when you've been married a long time, sex sort of loses its humor. <laughs> You don't have to go by me. You can ask Gracie. <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, maybe I'm not good on the stage, but when the lights are out, I get a lot of laughs. <laughs> but Desi, I'll tell you something. Don't let Lucy retire. Because when these girls retire, they quit. Boy, is Gracie retired. <laughs> she, uh, she got twin beds. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there comes a time you've worked hard all your life, you want to retire, and she just gave Max Factor back his makeup. <laughs> and with me, there was no sense in me doing anything because I retired the day I met Gracie. <laughs> but, Lucy, I'll tell you something. This might be a surprise to you, but... Years ago, I, uh, before I met Gracie, I also had a Spanish partner. Her uh, name was, let me think of her name. It's in my pocket here. I haven't worked with her for so long. Carmen, yeah, I couldn't think of her first name. Her name was Carmen Garcia. It was George Burns and Carmen Garcia. We did a ballroom dancing act. And uh, our billing was Fantastic Steppers. <laughs> And um, her name really wasn't Carmen Garcia. Her right name was Rose Cohen, but I named her after a cigar I was smoking. <laughs> and um, we, were, we were booked. We were booked by Farley Marcus, which was a booking office in those days. He used to book oh, one nighters and you'd get $5 an actor. If you did a single, you'd get $5. If you did a two-act, you'd get $10, and the trio would get 15 and so on. And uh, food was short. We were quite hungry. And I was sitting outside of Farley Marcus's office when I heard Farley Marcus say to his girl that they could use a dog act in Ron Conkoma. And I told his girl, I said, tell Farley Marcus that Burns and Garcia and his dogs are sitting outside. <laughs> and uh, we got a contract and we went to Ron Conkoma and I picked up two dogs on 45th Street. <laughs> and... And to show you that we knew what time it was, we, we, our opening number was a thing called Lazarina, which was a Russian mazurka, but we were dressed in Spanish clothes. <laughs> and she had a big comb that used to press on a nerve that didn't help our acting. <laughs> and we, 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 we got to Ron Conkama with these dogs. <laughs> And she stood on the stage with one dog under one arm, and I stood on the stage with one dog under the other arm. And the orchestra played the introduction to Lazarina, and she dropped her dog, and I dropped my dog. And the dogs did what they were supposed to do. And we did what we did, and we got $10. And 
glad we ain't. <laughs> but you know, it's funny, but Lucy, uh, I mean, Desi and I are in the same boat. We've always had a head of a partner. In fact, I worked with Desi a couple of years ago. I don't remember what cigar I named him after. <laughs> but this was in, in, in Catalina Island. Remember that, uh, Desi? Yeah. And uh, we were all there, and they had a boat, and finally about... 11 o'clock at night, Lucy went back on the boat and she went to sleep and Gracie went upstairs and she went to bed and Desi got out his guitar and we both sang and he played the guitar. How two men could clear a bar room in three minutes and still be in show business, I'll never understand. We were, we were pathetic. But... Um, I do want to say that, in conclusion here, that uh, Desi and Lucy had a fabulous success, and uh, I want to wish them. I can't wish them a lot of luck, because they've had it, but I do want to wish you a lot of health, and I hope that you're happy for the rest of your lives. And in conclusion, it's always nice to finish a monologue with a big laugh, so I'll sit down and try to think of one. <laughs> Amazing fellow. Amazing thing about George's work is everything he says is true. Well, everything is true. I'm going to take a moment here to introduce one guest in the audience who has flown in from Detroit to be with us tonight and represents one of the charities that the friars are helping. The distinguished presence of the very revered Father Nicholas Maestrini, the Provincial Superior of the Missionaries of St. Peter's and Paul. We're delighted to have you here, Father. As you know, there are far too many guests and dignitaries in the audience to introduce, but we do want to acknowledge the presence of a number of Democrats who have recently been elected. <laughs> We'd also like to mention the yeoman service performed by the Friars Welfare Board that has the administration of all the money raised, Doctors Blank, Goldman, Kostacek, Lands, Lennon, Rabwin, and Rose. Thank you, gentlemen, for working backstage. <laughs> Only one more acknowledgment, and that is to pay tribute to the talented architects of this wonderful dinner, steaks and all, Joe Cooper, Jules James, Artie Stebbins, co-chairman Harry Carl, and Barry Merkin. Gentlemen. One guest who could not be here, unfortunately, especially since he had so much to do with the career of Lucy, is our very dear friend, Eddie Cantor. And he has illness in his family. He is in Palm Springs, and I understand that Ida is not well. And he was going to be here because, as you know, he had a lot to do. As a matter of fact, I'll read the wire from him. The illness in my family keeps me from adding my tribute in person to my very old and dear friends, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. And Eddie says, if I were a dirty dog, I'd tell you how many years ago I first met Lucy. It was 1933. <laughs> in a picture for Goldwyn called Roman Scandals, Lucy was a showgirl with great beauty and loaded with personality. She had a comic sense, even then. She kept the members of the cast and the crew laughing all through the filming of the picture. And everybody was stuck on this gal, especially me. And if she would have married me, right now, she could have been a lovely white-haired Jewish woman. <laughs> the mother of five girls and done all her shopping on Fairfax Avenue. <laughs> but going from bagels to bongo is the best thing that ever happened to Lucy. She married one of the nicest guys in or out of show business. I remember Desi in a hospital during World War II. He was in charge of entertainment for our fighting men. You are no sooner through with your songs and gags when he had his arm around you, giving you the Cuban business. <laughs> what it says here. Anyhow, he tell you you were wonderful and can you come back Friday. They love you here and no matter what engagements you had, you were back on Friday. Such was his power of persuasion. He has never lost it. In these United States of America, we have many great industries, automobiles, motion pictures, steel, oil, and now we've added Desi Lu. It couldn't have happened to two nicer people. A credit to their profession, to their country, to the whole human race. God bless them. Eddie Cannon.
Many of you will remember when we were stealing money in the business called radio a few years ago. Eddie Cantor was one of our big radio stars, and along with him in the roster of his show business colleagues and co-workers was a bright comedy star named Parkia Karkas, who every week managed to convulse everybody and who, with his Greek dialect, has done for the Greeks what Desi has done for the Cubans, <laughs> set back the United States relations with him about a century. <laughs> It's rumored that Parky was here last night catering the Greek dinner, but at all events, he has remained over and he is going to serve up some of the verbal hors d'oeuvres, which are such a tasty dish when he handles them. I want you to meet a great guy and a fine friar, Harry Einstein. Parky Karkis. Thank you very much. Distinguished and honored guests, my brother Friars, ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed a very great honor for me to have been asked to sit up here tonight on this dais which is made up of perhaps the greatest array of theatrical talent in the world and the great privilege of speaking here is assuredly in no wise diminished by the fact that as co-chairman of the membership committee of the Friars Club that it now becomes my most pleasant duty to officially welcome perhaps the most talented, the best loved, and most certainly the best known couple in the theatrical world today, my very dear and very close friends, Miss Louise Bowles. <laughs> delighted to welcome you into our club because we know what a prominent club man you are. <laughs> I have the great I have the great satisfaction of belonging to several exclusive clubs with him, such as the Diners Club, <laughs> the Book of the Month Club, and the Automobile Club in Southern California. <laughs> I tried to get into the Los Angeles Country Club, <laughs> But they don't take actors. <laughs> but you must not think that the Friars Club is an easy club to get into. <laughs> Quite to the contrary, it is most difficult before a prospective candidate has even issued an application, he must first satisfy us, beyond any question of a doubt, that he is either a resident <laughs> or a non-resident of the state of California. then must be proposed by 
and then vouched for by at least two men who are listed in the phone book. <laughs> then his name is turned over to our screening committee. Chairman of which is Chico Marx. <laughs> who is ably assisted by Ben Platt <laughs> and Tony Martin's father. These men then conduct a searching investigation <laughs> into the character and reputation of the candidate, and no stone is left unturned. Sometimes these rigid inquiries drag on for five or six minutes. <laughs> After the candidate is deemed to be worthy, he is then allowed to write out a check in the amount of the initiation fee. But he is still not yet a friar. There is a further waiting period. We wait for the ink to dry on the check. But in spite of all this kidding, we have managed to put together a pretty good club, made up of the very cream of show business people, the city's leading merchant princes, outstanding doctors, many famous lawyers, several fine judges, and quite a few defendants. <laughs> You know, we have recently completely redecorated our club rooms. We were very fortunate in securing the services of an outstanding interior decorator who came to us very highly recommended by the Washingtonian Home for the Blind. (laughs) 